So the way um, economists look at uh, any new technology is they look at its progression over time and they uh, try to reduce that technology to a reduction in the cost of something. So when you had semiconductors, you have this sort of curve in terms of the reduction in cost for semiconductors. And the issue is what is on the y-axis. And actually, when you think about it, what's on the y-axis is the cost of arithmetic. What semiconductors have been able to do by progressing is to dramatically reduce the cost of arithmetic. And that's all that computers really do. Uh, it's just that we can do a lot of arithmetic now, uh, many orders of magnitude uh, that could be achieved without a computer. Um, and so you tend to therefore have more of the thing that you reduce the cost of being done. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't surprising that some of the initial applications for computers were to compute things we were already computing by hand, such as artillery tables, or to use it in accounting. Uh, and then we started to get more sophisticated uses based on the fact that we could do a lot of arithmetic. We could now do new things that we weren't doing before, such as uh, computer games or electronic mail or uh, uh, digital music or digital pictures, all versions of arithmetic. But the latter set of them not really seen as traditional arithmetic problems until we had very cheap arithmetic to do, deal with them. Um, and we played the same trick in, in a book that I wrote with Jay Agarwal and Avi Goldfarb called Prediction Machines when we looked at the uh, economics of artificial intelligence. And we asked the same question is, you take one of these new neural networks, deep learning, uh, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms, and you say, well, what, what does this look like to an economist? And what it looks like is a reduction in the cost of something uh, and that cut reductions are all occurring right at the moment uh, in terms of that. And what is being, what is the cost of the thing being reduced? Well, it turns out that it's prediction. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, has uh, had great strides in its applicability in recent years. But essentially, uh, AI um, uh, algorithms, as they currently exist in, in all of their forms, are doing only one thing. And that is they're doing uh, cheaper prediction. Uh, they're able to predict things more cheaply. Um, and so you can use that to say, well, we're going to get a lot more prediction and we're going to get prediction applied to different problems. So that's what it is. So the question we'd ask with respect to the blockchain is what's it reducing the cost of? And the answer uh, that myself and Christian Catalini, who's a professor at MIT and is now chief economist of the DM Association, uh, uh, was that it was reducing the cost of verification. Now, what are we, or potentially reducing that cost? What do we uh, mean by that? Um, well, if you, if you think about things at a transaction level, uh, transactions have stages. They're born, uh, the actions are performed on the basis of that transaction, and then in the future, some problem may arise. So, you have you give birth to a transaction that has certain attributes uh, that it exists to the parties, timestamp, conflict resolution rules, considerations, so on, so forth. Then people taking into account that uh, agreement that was uh, reached will perform certain actions, and they'll perform actions in expectation that other people to to the agreement will also perform those actions. So that's a that's the whole point of a contract. And then you have a problem that might arise because no contract is perfect. And in that case, when there's a problem or conflict, you have to go back and you have to say, well, what did we agree to? And who's in violation of it? And has people done what they said they'd do? And that's the process of verification. Now, prior to a blockchain, you generally have to do verification through an intermediary, uh, some sort of audit, some sort of judicial process, etc. cetera. Um, and this was costly. Um, the potential of a blockchain is to make this uh, costless by uh, inscribing the attributes of the transaction on the blockchain, as well as the performance of any actions. Uh, you can make verification a cinch uh, because all of those things are already embedded. And this is important because if you think about 
um, problems of uh, you know manipulation of information, disagreements, and so forth. It's really that immutability of the blockchain uh, that takes that out of the hands of people and makes it more reliable. And that's what really a reduction in the cost of verification is going to do. So just to give you an example, imagine you had a simple contract like this. Acme Core agrees to pay Wiley Coyote $100 to catch the Roadrunner by April 1st, 2019. And that's signed on the 1st of January, 2018. Um, the Roadrunner is caught. Uh, Wiley Coyote goes back to Acme Corp and says, ah, this was our contract. Uh, you agreed to pay me $200, right? So you can see here that there are uh, now a dispute. Uh, there's one contract and there's another contract. Um, so how do you resolve that particular dispute? Um, which is the contract that was actually agreed upon uh, is going to be an important thing to be able to determine. Um, this was already fine in the physical paper world. Uh, maybe you'd have a, each have a piece of paper uh, and you'd have to match it up, although you can imagine situations where even that is imperfect. Uh, but it certainly was going to be a big issue in the digital realm where it's very easy to adjust some of the parameters involved. And just to tell you why, how easy it is, I mean, there was this uh, article from a couple of years ago um, about somebody who was literally sending invoices to Google and Facebook. You'd think very sophisticated, technological, technologically sophisticated companies uh, and invoicing them for stuff that was, there was never an agreement and never done and then getting paid up to 121 million uh, in total. Um, before getting caught. Um, one suspects that could have done half that amount and not been caught. Um, but the point is that some level, Facebook and Google found it cheaper to pay out these invoices than to have internal checking procedures that verified that there was an agreement in place, that the thing had been performed and that the payment was legitimate. So, you know, if Facebook and Google can be subject to this, imagine the rest of the world.